Good morning once more. Uh, let me t- ask us to turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. It's a privilege to bring God's word on the second Sunday of the year. And the privilege that that also brings is an ability to sound the keynote uh, for the year to the church. Psalm 91. And I'll read the whole psalm to us. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your right, at your right side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your, your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to be for you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will trade on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will tramp underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we plead again that you bless the preaching of your word. Grant insight, grant grace, grant mercy. May your spirit be present with both the preacher and the listener. Glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, and may he be lifted up through the proclamation of your word. We ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's true to say that the year has started on a perilous note. Uppermost in our minds is the truth of the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic that is wreaking havoc in the world, in our country in particular. Whereas in the first wave, many of us would have heard of those who were affected from a rather remote sense. This time round, it's on our doorsteps. It's in our houses. And it's close to, we know the people close to us who've been affected or either infected and have had it. So this makes us wonder how the year will turn, will turn out. Another thing that is at the back of our minds as 2021 begins are the general elections that are scheduled for the 12th of August. And with the recent happenings of the killings of two innocent uh, citizens, many people are rather apprehensive and fearful what the year will actually turn out. Will it be better or will it be worse? Will there be more violence? What exactly do we expect? And so in a sense, there's a mood of general fear, anxiety, and pessimism. But the question is, is that how believers need to live? Is that how we must respond to such times, times of danger, times of trials, and difficult times that we face? Psalm 91 says an emphatic no. From Psalm 91, we can see that what this person is talking about is that believers are safe in God. And therefore, I want to draw your attention to this psalm. Psalm 91 can be said to be a psalm of assurance, particularly when the going is tough. It is an Old Testament equivalent of Romans 8, 31 to 39, where Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how much, how, how will he not also 
we, with him graciously give us all things. And then he asked the question, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And the answer is an emphatic that nothing, nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We are more than conquerors. And so this is what this psalm in the Old Testament is trying to put there, that believers, believers in God are more than conquerors. They face tough situations, difficult times with a certain confidence that is only there in those who believe in God. The ancient rabbis interpreted this psalm as a song for evil encounters. It was sung and used to avert attacks of demons who were thought to be responsible for, for all the illnesses and pestilence. And to some extent, you can't blame them because in the times of the rabbis, in the ancient times, they did not know exactly that there were germs and viruses and, uh, and, and parasites that caused disease. For them, when there was an evil encounter, when there was illness and pestilence, they would sing this song as a way to avert those, to put their trust in God in the midst of a pestilence, in the midst of illnesses that were happening at the time. And for sure, even in church history, this psalm has played an important part. During an outbreak of cholera in Germany, one of the physicians there used to recite this psalm to himself as he was busy treating the patients of cholera. Knowing that it was, it's a very infectious disease, he himself could get it. But because of that, he would say that this psalm was the best preservative in such times. Spurgeon in London, when there was a pest and a plague and, and people of his congregation were getting sick, he would still be visiting the sick and the dying of his congregation. And he would be reciting this psalm. And no wonder he writes and comments on this psalm. He says that in the whole collection, there is not a more cheering psalm. Its tone is elevated and sustained throughout. Faith is at its best and speaks nobly. And in its truth, it is a heavenly medicine against plague and pests. And here's a point. He who can live in its spirit will be fearless. He who can live in the spirit of Psalm 91, especially verse 1 and 2, which is the premise for the protection, he says, will be fearless. So in a literal sense, Psalm 91 is, belongs to a combination of psalms like Psalm 90, 91, and 92. And Psalm 91 seems to be the answer to the prayer that is made in Psalm 90. In Psalm 90 and verse 14, in the Song of Moses, there Moses prays to God in verse 14, says, Satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Verse 15, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. And in Psalm 91 verse 15, it's as if the Lord answers this and says, with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Him who trusts in me and who calls upon me, I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. So Psalm 90 is sort of answered by Psalm 91. Psalm 91 neatly breaks up into three parts. Verse 1 and 2 tells us of the confidence, the bold confession of one who trusts in God. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 3 to verse 13 tells us of the protective care that the Lord gives to those who trust in him. And verse 14 to verse 16 tells us of the pledge that God is giving. He's confirming this promise to those who trust in him. And so we we'll neatly divide this uh, psalm into three parts. Verse 1 and 2 we we'll talk about as the promise to those who take their refuge in God. To those who take refuge in God. This is, there's a promise there. In verse 3 to verse, 14, verse 13, we see the protection for those who take refuge in God. The protection is well outlined. And then verse 14 to verse 16, we see the pledge that the God gives to those who take refuge in him. But for this morning, we'll mostly focus on verse 1 and 2 of this psalm. In, in verse 1 and 2, we're told there that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And so in these two verses, we see an encouragement and a promise that is made. 
It's almost as if two people are speaking here. And that's why the old writers used to think that this was David speaking to his son Solomon, saying that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And then they would imagine that Solomon then affirms this to himself and say, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then the voice changes in verse 3 to the one who first spoke. But it's not to be understood like that. It's just the psalmist himself confessing to us. He is sort of telling us his own testimony of faith before he tells us exactly what he believes in. So in essence, the psalmist declares his own faith before declaring it to us. And the psalm expresses, um, the, 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 he starts with an expression that relates to different real life experiences. The word dwell in the shelter reminds us of those who go and stay in a certain place for a night. When he says that they will dwell in the shelter of the Most High and abide by the night in the shadow of the Most High, it refers that to everyday experiences that people face, especially those who are being persecuted or are facing threats. They rush to seek shelter. They rush to find protection in someone. And so from these two verses, we notice firstly that there's a general statement of the Lord being a refuge. We see that in verse 1. There's a general statement. And then in verse 2, we see that there's a personal statement. So let's, let's begin with a general statement in verse 1 there. We're told that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This tells us that all those who live in a life of communion with God are constantly safe under his protection and may therefore have peace and security of mind at all times. It spells out the truth of Isaiah 26 and verse 3, that the Lord will keep him in perfect peace, him whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. So it tells us that those who live a life of communion, constant communion with God are safe under his protection. And that's why the idea of the word dwelling, he says, he who dwells, is that the idea of staying, sitting, and abiding in the shelter of the Most High. It entails a life of constant communion with God. It speaks of the character of a true believer who dwells in the secret place of God. He loves to recline to be in the secret place of God. Like Matthew Henry would put it, that this believer is at home with God. He returns to God and finds his rest and tranquility in God. He acquaints himself with the inward religion of prayer and finds he worships God within the veil and loves to be alone with God, to converse with him in solitude, in private. And such a one, he say that he dwells in the shelter of the Most High. He knows the constant communion with God. He, he frequently runs to God. He knows the inward religion of prayer, of coming down to God and staying there. He stays with God. He sits with God. He abides with God. This is a Daniel who would pray in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. He was in constant communion with God, and he would pray looking to Jerusalem where the temple was so that God would hear him as he prayed. And in the New Testament, the temple is the Lord Jesus. And those who pray to him, pray to him through Jesus Christ. No wonder when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, the truth of verse 11 of this um, psalm came to true. In verse 11, it says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And we're told that the angels came and locked the mouth of the lions. Why? Because Daniel dwelt in the shelter of the Most High. He spent his time with God. There was a very close communion. Like certain commentators would say that Daniel is the John of the Old Testament. He knew sweet communion with God. This is what is true about him. This is like David who says that he would pray in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, giving thanks to God. And whenever you read the life of David, you see a constant communion with God. He was dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. He's facing attacks from Saul. He runs in God's presence and he runs to the cave and that's how he would say, you are my rock, you are my refuge to whom I run. He prayed often. He would not do anything without seeking the Lord's uh, direction. He would inquire of the Lord, shall we attack the Philistines or not? And the Lord would say, don't, yes, go, because he was dwelling there. He lived a life of constant communion 
with God. This is true, and actually in its truest sense, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would early in the morning, before dawn, he would rise and go spend time in communion with his Father, even when there were so many people seeking his presence, seeking his healing, seeking his attention, he would recline and withdraw and spend time with his father. He would spend the whole night on the mountain praying. And that's why we're told that after his temptation, 40 days, angels came and ministered to him. Do you remember in the garden when he was there sweating as, like, like, as it were drops of blood? We're told that angels came and ministered to him. The truth again of verse 11 of Psalm 91, that God would command his angels concerning him to guard you in all your ways because he dwelt in the shelter of the Most High. He dwelt in the shelter of the Most High. Do you dwell in the shelter of the Most High? Or do you just visit it? Could you be described that you, 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 you are the one who's being spoken about, that he who dwells because you do, or you're just one of those who knows, who knows God by hearsay from a distance, you follow from afar. You, you don't know what the joys of private communion with God are, of inward religion of prayer and seeking God constantly, as Daniel did. And besides, he was more, more busy than most of us. He was third in the kingdom but he still found time to pray morning, afternoon, and evening. He dwelt, he dwelt in the shelter of the Most High. And so I agree with Spurgeon when Spurgeon says that this promise is not for all believers. No, it's for those who dwell, those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. And then we're told further on that those that dwell in the shelter of the Most High who abide who abide in the shadow of the Most High. Sorry, in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so this is the privilege and comfort of those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Either they have a secure sense in God. They have a peace of mind. They feel secure in God. And in a sense, they know that it doesn't matter what happens to them because God is with them. If God allows that a virus should infect them and give them disease, they know it's because he has allowed it. The Lord Jesus says that not even a hair will fall from you unless the Father permits it. Those who dwell have a sense of security. They are in the shadow of the Almighty. And the word shadow here has a root meaning of lodging in a place so that the night can pass. The shadow simply speaks of protection and security. In Isaiah 30 and verse 3, the word there is used in this way. Isaiah speaks of the Israelites wanting to go find protection in Egypt. And he's, he's telling them, don't go to Egypt. Don't go find refuge in Pharaoh. Find your refuge in God. So in Isaiah 30 verse 3, Isaiah says this, Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame, and the shelter, of, the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame, and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. In a sense, he was saying that you're yes, going to seek protection in Pharaoh, in Egypt. You're going to seek shelter, uh, shadow in, in, in Egypt. So in the same way, in other words, what, what the psalmist is saying in verse 1 here is that they who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the protective care of God. God will come between them and everything that would endanger them, whether a storm or sunshine, whatever dangers that they will face, they shall not only be accepted in his shadow, but to have a residence under God's protection. He will be their rest and refuge forever. They will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so, abiding in the shadow of the Almighty reminds us of the passage that we read in Deuteronomy 32, because Deuteronomy 32, sort of the overtones of Deuteronomy 32 can be found in Psalm 91. There in Deuteronomy 32, Moses says that God cared for his children Israel. In verse 10, he says, he found him in a desert land and in a holding west of the wilderness. God encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stares up its nest, 
that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on, on his pinions. So in a sense, God was hovering over his children like an eagle does under its, its young. And should it see danger coming, whether in a form of a snake to get the, to, 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 to the young eagles, the eagle comes and attacks and protects its own. This is what God is doing here. All those who dwell in the shelter of the Almighty come under his shadow, his protective care. He makes sure that he is the one who protects them. It's as if the Lord Jesus was somewhat a fulfillment of this, when in the garden the soldiers came to arrest the disciples, and he came and stood between the soldiers and the disciples and said, you seek me, let them go. And he protected them. And likewise, that's what God does for us. But you ask, doesn't this, doesn't it mean that the Lord's protection is the same for all believers? To answer that, I would ask another question. Is the Lord near to all his people to the same degree? In James chapter 4, verse 8, James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. In a sense, there's a sense in which those who are very intentional and deliberate about drawing near to God that God reveals himself in a special way. They that desire deliberately to spend more time with God in prayer, in private, and seeking him in the word, God is near to them, closer to them than he is to others. And the same is spoken in the psalm, that it is those who dwell, it is those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. It is those who enjoy the privileges and blessings of this. Remember David, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, who spent lots of time in prayer. But when he sinned against God, there was a sense in which the presence of God was withdrawn. So in the same way, it's those who are deliberate to spend time with God, those who call upon him. In Psalm 91, verse 14, the Lord actually spells out the people who he gives this privilege to. In verse 14 of Psalm 91, it says, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Verse 15, when he calls to me, I will answer him. In a sense, the people who are the very description of this care are those who hold fast to the Lord in love. They don't let go of him. They're like, Jacob, I will not leave you until you bless me. And he would spend the whole night wrestling with God so that God would be with him. He holds fast to me in love. But not only holding fast, he actually calls upon him. He knows God's name. So it's for those who are deliberate to hold fast to God. But I must clarify that yes, believers do face trials. We do go through difficult times. And when we go through them, it doesn't mean that God has forsaken. At some time back in the US, there was a shooting at a Baptist church. And the pastor of that church wasn't there. So when he came back after the shooting had happened and the police and the reporters came, one reporter rushed out because the, during the killing, people died. And one of the reporters went and asked the Baptist pastor and said, where was your God when the shooting was happening and people were dying? And the pastor, after a pause, answered and said, God was where he was when Jesus was being crucified on his throne. So even when believers are going through difficult times, even when the Son of God is being crucified because of malice, it's because God has permitted it for his glory. And that's why we must dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, because we will not fear what, be, what, what happens to us, because we will know that we will not go through anything that is not allowed by the Heavenly Father. We have a sense of security. We'll be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who will say, I will, we will not bow down to this image. We know that our God is able to save us, but even if he does not, we know that we'll still stand, and God came through for them. One like the Son of Man stood in the flame with them, and they were not scorched. That's how believers respond in difficult times of COVID-19. Are we going to be fearful? 
or are we going to abide in the shelter of the Most High? Are we going to be in the shadow of the Almighty? That whatever be tied, God is still on his throne. And he's the one who allows whether the arrow hits you or it doesn't. Because everything that happens to us is for his glory and not for our sake. It's for those who dwell. So don't miss the point of verse 1. It's those who dwell in the shelter. Dwelling, dwelling, dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. Secondly, let's look at the personal statement that is put up in verse 2. So that's a general statement. That he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. But then there's a personal confession of faith that the psalmist puts up in verse 2 here. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So verse 2 personalizes this truth to the psalmist. It's one thing to know that those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will abide in his shadow, will be under his protective care. It's another to make it a personal statement of faith. It's another to commit yourself to this. Listen to the psalmist again. He says, I, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress and my God in whom I trust. My, my refuge and my fortress my God, in whom I, I personally trust. It's a bit like what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. The apostle Paul there does not say that for to live is Christ and to die is gain. The apostle Paul doesn't say that. He says, for to me, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. For to me, to other people, you can have other things that you live for and die for. But for me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. In the same way, the psalmist says, For me, I will say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's a personal statement of faith. And the truth of this is that some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. Some have other gods in whom they trust. The people of old would have trusted in a bow or another god that would deliver them. Some trusted in the strength of an army to protect them and shield them from everything that would come. In our day to day time, some trust in money, that money will protect them from all calamities. It's a big war that will shield them from COVID-19. But that's not true. Money will not protect anyone from anything. When I was reading through the history, I read that when the Titanic sank on the 15th of April, 1915, on board of the Titanic was one of the world's richest men, who in our day would have been over $2.3 billion in wealth. But when the calamity came of sinking in the Titanic, his millions and billions of dollars could not save him. He sunk to his peril. Others, they trust not in money, but perhaps in family or career or whatever it is. So in a sense, we all have our own refuge. Just like a fox, when it's in trouble, he would to run to his own hole. The question is, who do you run to? What's your personal statement of faith? Are you like the psalmist who says, I know that the Lord is a shelter and a shadow for those who put their trust in him. And I, I personally, will say to him, you are my refuge, you are my fortress, you are my God in whom I trust. That's a personal statement of faith. And I'll ask you, what is your refuge? See, the, the beauty about this time is that COVID-19 is quite an equalizer. The affluent in the West are affected. Most of them are under lockdown. They, they, they cannot even move in the streets because of a single virus. The poor in the Western, uh, in, in, in Africa and the third world countries are also affected. The question is, what is our refuge in such a time? What is your refuge 
in trying times, in difficult times, where do you run to? Where you run to tells where your faith is. For those of us who have little children, we know that when a child is scared, the first thing they will do is to run to their father or to their mother because for now we are like the refuge that they have. We, we are their fortress. They believe we will protect them. But a child of God must say like the psalmist, you are my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And the question I have is, is God your refuge through Jesus Christ? Do you trust in him? Do you run to him? But before I conclude, I want you to notice that in these two verses, there are four names of God. And this is the reason why the psalmist is so bold to say, I will say to the Lord, you are my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom we trust. Because he sort of describes the kind of God who gives this kind of protection. In verse 1, the name that comes out of God is most high. Look at it in Psalm, verse, uh, Psalm 91 verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. The second name that comes out is also in verse 1. Who abide in the shadow of the Almighty. In verse 2, we see that he says, I will say to the Lord, it's in capital. And he says, you are my refuge, my strength, my God. That's the fourth name in whom I trust. So in a sense, Most High is the name Elion. And that's the name that we meet in Genesis 14 when Abraham is met by Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest uh, and king. And there in Genesis 14, if I may read it for you, Genesis 14 verse 18 to 22, listen to how this name keeps coming up. And it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. Listen to how Abraham responds, having trust in God most high. Abraham says, But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. So in a sense, when we're talking about most high, we're thinking about God's position and possession, that he is the most exalted, he's the most supreme, he occupies the highest office in the universe, he's the possessor of heaven and earth. Secondly, we meet the name Almighty, and this is the name El Shaddai. And we meet this name again in Genesis 17, when God comes down to Abraham after many years that he has promised him that he'll give him an offspring. And God comes to Abraham, I think he was 100 years old, and Sarah was 75 years old. And God comes and affirms his promise, say, I will give you an offspring through Sarah. And Sarah was beyond childbearing age. And God says, I will do it because I am God. El Shaddai, all powerful. I'm able to do this. There's nothing too difficult for me. And that's why when the Messiah was to be born, he was not born from a married woman who was barren, but from a virgin who was not even married. Because God is able to do the impossible. He's God all powerful, God almighty. The third name that the psalmist introduces in verse 2, he says, the Lord, meaning Yahweh. And this is the God who had revealed himself to Abraham, but much more now to Moses. In Exodus 3, God says, I am who I am. I am the covenant-keeping God. I made a promise to Abraham that I would give him the land of Canaan as an inheritance. Therefore, I am the God who's going to keep that covenant. And later on, when the children of Israel have sinned and have made a golden calf against the God who had delivered them, the Lord again re appears and reveals himself to Moses and proclaims his name in Exodus 36 and says, 34, sorry, says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who by no means clear the guilty. I am a God who keeps my covenant. I am the Lord. 
And the last name that we see again in verse 2, he says, my God. And this is the name Elohim, meaning that he is the divine one. He's a supreme being. He's a mighty one. We meet this name in Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is the king of the universe. He's a supreme being. There's no one who's above him. He is the highest that there is. And therefore, now you can understand when the psalmist says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, the one who is the supreme God, who is the highest, no one is above him. And in Genesis 14, it's used in the context where God delivers five kings and their armies to Abraham with 316 men. Because he's the God Almighty, he's the Most High. He possesses the heavens and the earth and all that is in, in them. It doesn't matter whether it's a virus or it's a parasite or bacteria or it's an army, whatever it's man, they all belong to him. He's the God most high. And those who find shelter in him are secure. Those who find shelter in the all-powerful, El Shaddai, Almighty, who, who, who can attack them? Who can go to them and break them and, and make them insecure? They're under the protection of the most powerful being in the whole universe. And that's why the Lord Jesus says that my sheep are secure. They are held in the palms of my Father and no one can take them away from me. We are hidden in God because he's the Almighty. And that's why he says again, I'll say to, me, to the Lord, the covenant-keeping God, he who doesn't break his promise, whether we sin or not, he's still the covenant-keeping God. And says, I will say to him, you are my refuge, you are my fortress. I'll say to the supreme divine God, the Elohim, that in you I'll put my trust. This is the God who offers such protection, that they that take refuge in him are secure. Who, who can attack his people? Who can bring a charge against God's people? What, who can do anything against us if God has not allowed it? Not one. Not a single supreme, not a single person who thinks is so high in this world. Not a single virus. Because we, can, we come under the protection of God Most High. We come under the protection of God Almighty. We come under the protection of Yahweh, the Lord who is a covenant-keeping God. And we come under the maker of the heavens and the earth, the supreme God. And that's why, correlating to the names of God, the psalmist uses four words again for this protection. He says, shelter, shadow, refuge, fortress. It's, 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 it's all encompassing. Shelter, shadow, refuge, fortress. A shelter is a hiding place, a covering place, a safe place for those who abide in God Most High. The shadow is that protection from the heat, protection from danger, and they all have it in God. Refuge and fortress speaks of military language, that they are being pursued, but God becomes their refuge who protects them. And that's why David in Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. In Psalm 61 verse 4, David again says, Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. And when David was delivered from Saul, in Psalm 18 verse 1 and 3, David sings to God and says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord, my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I am saved from my enemies. That's faith. That's faith in God, knowing that there's no other protection except the protection that we have in God. And so if, in the New Testament, you remember that when the disciples were in the boats and the storm came, who did they run to? They ran to the rock, their refuge, the Lord Jesus. And he spoke a word, and the sea was calm. They knew who to run to. And so, in conclusion, 
Let me remind you again that the promise is for those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. It's for those who know God, not by hearsay, not because you come to church or you listen to preaching. No, but because you've got a personal relationship with God. You walk with Him. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ and you've put your faith and trust in Him. And because you are in Christ, you dwell in Christ. And the Lord Jesus says that if, you, if my word abides in you and you in me, then you will come and have fellowship with the Father and myself. Do you know God personally through Jesus Christ? Have your sins been forgiven? Is God your refuge and your strength? Where do you run to in times of trouble? In times when COVID-19 hits and who knows you may be the next person to get it and who knows if the Lord would spare your life. Do you have a refuge? Do you have an anchor in Jesus Christ? So the promise for those who dwell, those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. In the New Testament, we see Jesus who has come as God Emmanuel, our Emmanuel, God with us. And in Luke chapter 13, the Lord Jesus speaks to Jerusalem. He sort of stands and they're about to persecute him and, and eventually crucify him. But then the Lord stands and then speaks of Jerusalem in these terms. In Luke 13 verse 34, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. And these are the words that you must take note of. He says, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers at brook under her wings? And you were not willing. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brook, her brood under her wings? and you were not willing. In a sense, the Lord Jesus comes as the one who was willing to give shelter and protection to those who would trust in him. But those in Jerusalem were not willing to put their trust in him. They were not willing and therefore they suffered the destruction that came later on. And I warn you that if you do not seek protection in Christ, you will, you will suffer. Not, not, not so much the disease and die. A more dangerous plague, and that is hell, where you will burn forever and ever. But those who have their protection in Christ will know the shelter of the Almighty in heaven. But one last thing I must say is that the one who exemplified this, the truth of this verse was actually the Lord Jesus himself. He dwelt in the shelter of the Most High, and he abided in his shadow. The Lord was his refuge and his fortress. But a time came when he hung on the cross, when it was as if this shelter, this shadow, the refuge, the fortress was taken away. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why have you left me to die like this? And it's as if God would say so that his people would always abide in my shadow. He died because he bore our sins, and therefore he sort of forfeited the privileges of this psalm so that we can enjoy them if we put our faith and trust in him. He would die so that we can be saved in his blood and enjoy the blessings of verse 1 and 2, and later on, as we shall see, God willing, our next Sunday, the protection that is given to his people. So my question is, have you put your faith in this Jesus who forfeited the blessing of the psalm so that you and me can dwell in the shelter of the Most High and abide in the shadow of the Almighty? Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we pray that we'll be those who will be truly described as dwell in the shelter of the Most High that we actually abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I plead with you, Father, that many of us could say like the psalmist, that I will say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. By your Spirit inspire faith, 
by your spirit cause those who do not know Jesus Christ to come to him in faith and repentance. And for believers who may perhaps be far off and not dwelling in the shelter of the Most High, to come close again, to resolve that this year that will be their dwelling place, the shelter of the Most High. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.